Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We'll be looking at verses 19 through 23. Romans 8. 19 through 23. What is a Christian? A Christian is a person, as we have found in our study through the book of Romans, who is justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Justified by faith alone. A Christian, by biblical definition, is not looking to themselves in any way to qualify for God's approval. One day when he or she is standing before God the Creator and the judge, the Christian will not say, well, I did this or I did that. Will not say I was consistent or I was sincere. No. A Christian will say, Jesus died for me and saved me from my sin. All glory to Jesus. A Christian is a person who is justified by faith in Jesus Christ. A person is a person who has been joined to Jesus Christ, has been placed into Christ, into his death to sin and his resurrection to new life. So that as sin used to reign over us, now grace reigns through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. A Christian is a person who, being joined to Christ, is a child of God, born again with new spiritual life, adopted as an adult legal heir of God, with all of the rights and privileges that come with that highest of all privileges in the universe. A Christian is a person who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. God himself has come to live in me. That is what it is to be a Christian. And he gives us assurance. The Spirit himself, verse 16, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, verse 17, that heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be also glorified with him. A Christian is a person for whom the fact of suffering is a reason for assurance. Far from being a reason to despair, suffering is the path that Jesus walked. And we get the privilege of walking that same path in fellowship with him. And we know, if we are thinking biblically, that for us, no suffering is wasted. None of it is without purpose. It's preparing us for glory. And our emphasis for today, a Christian is a person who's waiting for the glory. That's how Paul handled suffering. He focused on the glory that is coming. He followed the footsteps of his Lord and Savior and Master, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Paul focused on the joy that was set before him, the glory of his master. He did not deny the reality of his sufferings, but he focused on something that is so much bigger that he was able to say, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this momentary light affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And so he was able to say, again from 2 Corinthians 4, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Now, I think many Christians have to confess that doesn't seem to be the way it works for me. The trials and sufferings I'm going through, they just seem so huge, so overwhelming. I, I just can't deal with it. It just seems so dark and so defeating. Well, that's because our view of the glory is so small. If, if we 
take the time to contemplate the glory that's coming. Even when we do that, we tend to think only in terms of our personal comfort and gain and enjoyment, but it's, it's so much more than that, so much grander than that. And this is vital doctrine. Paul doesn't waste his ink in writing about this. And, you know, and then when we get to the end of the chapter, he says, we are more than conquerors in spite of tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. We are more than conquerors. But I tell you what, we will not act like more than conquerors if we have a small view of the coming glory. The, the, the truth he lays out here. He does it in logical steps. Look, look at verse, how verse 18 begins. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing. Verse 19, for the creation waits with eager longing. Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility. And each step is another level of logic that takes us deeper into the truth. He's about to demonstrate the greatness of the coming glory because if we have a glimpse of it, it will make us consider everything we're suffering now is not worth comparing to it. He wants us to understand, not just its certainty, not just the fact that it's future, but its greatness, its magnitude, its vastness. And he does that by first explaining how things are now, the present state of the universe. In fact, is you will find no final comfort if you don't understand why the world is the way it is. You know, 200 years ago, philosophers were very upbeat. Everything was evolving, they said. Even society was evolving and getting better. You know what? There's going to be a league of nations, and there will be no more war in that great disease will be eradicated, and all men will be brothers. And then came the 20th century, and the philosopher said, Ooh, there's no sense in the universe. They have no explanation. They have no hope. But there is an explanation. Verse 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Now, Paul uses very vivid language here. He says the creation waits. Now, that Greek word is, is a very strong term. Creation is waiting, and not just sitting around until something happens. It's waiting eagerly, expectantly for something to happen. And then he adds another vivid word that's translated with eager longing, and that Greek term suggests lifting up the head, stretching out the neck. He's just saying, when is it ever going to happen? And to bring out the dramatic reality, he personifies it. You know, we all remember your English classes, right? You know, personification and all that. Well, personification is when you treat something as not alive as if it were. He's treating the creation as if it were a living, thinking thing. Do you remember in chapters 5 and 6 how we personified sin? To understand sin and how it works, we need to think of it as a living, thinking enemy who's out to take control of you. Well, here he personifies creation. If you want to understand the reality of the present situation, you need to think of the creation as alive and thinking and longing for something. You don't picture it like that, you'll miss the vivid reality. And this kind of language is, you find it a lot of scripture. For instance, like Isaiah 55, 12, for you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Well, 30 years ago, there's a chorus all Christians were singing. And then, of course, we're not going to say I don't sing anymore based on that verse. But that, that's, that is not just fantasy, folks. That is expressing the vivid reality. So what is the creation waiting for? For the revealing of the sons of God. The creation is waiting for us. For God to reveal us. 
God is going to put on an exhibition. He's going to show what he's done in us because God has come to the rescue that we may also be glorified in him. But why is the creation looking forward to this exhibition, the exhibition of the sons, the adult legal heirs of God? Because the faith of creation is linked to the faith of man who is made in the image of God. Now, a world system that has turned away from the knowledge of God thinks that people are just a very small outgrowth of the universe, just a little branch of the particles that stick together and process energy. They think the universe produced us. And though we may mess up the planet we're on, ultimately we have no real effect on the universe. That's what people think. Smart people. The people who think they're smart. But the Bible, and only the Bible, teaches that we have a huge effect on creation. 4, verse 20. The creation was subjected to futility. Futility means something that is not fulfilling its function. It's decaying. It's running down. Carries it still further in verse 21. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. It's like a piece of meat that's been left too long unrefrigerated. I had kind of a dramatic illustration of something I did with some meat I got and said, I won't but I won't get into that. It's putrefying, it's dying. And we sing. Change and decay in all around I see. Oh, thou changest not, abide with me. Now, why is this true? Why does it change and decay? Why is the whole creation ultimately futile? Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Who subjected it? Who made it like that? Not man. Man has been trying to keep it from decay and not very successfully. Was it the devil? No, the scripture does not indicate he has any such power. The one who subjected it was God. In Genesis chapter 3, the guilty pair stand before God. And to Adam, God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are. And to dust you shall return. The creation was cursed because of the sin of man. Cursed is the ground because of you. You do not understand the world if you do not believe this. This is why it's the way it is. This is why you come in from working in the garden, ruining the day you ever planted the stupid thing. You have never seen the world as God created it. But you will. Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Now, if you're following along in your Bible, don't stop reading there. That's the end of a verse. What do we do? Because the Bible is chopped into verses, we stop at the end of every verse. Whether is there a period there? Look at your Bible. Is there a period? No. So you don't stop. The Roman Catholic priest who chopped the Bible into verses did a really bad job chopping it right there. So let's read it the way Paul wrote it. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. When God announced to Adam, the curse that set painful limitations on him and all creation 
he also gave the promise of salvation. The woman's offspring will crush the head of the serpent. The curse is temporary because God is going to send the deliverer. God subjected the, to the subjected the creation to futility and bondage to corruption in hope of deliverance. Now, if hope sounds weak to you, it's because you, you use the word hope like people do who don't know God. Remember when you read your Bible, the word hope never means cross my fingers and hope. We'll see what actually happens. That's not what it means in the Bible. For the believer, the word hope in the Bible always means the rock solid assurance of the future because of the promises of God who cannot lie and cannot fail. Verse 21, the creation itself will be set free. Just as God subjected the creation to futility and corruption because of man's sin, so when he displays his saved, glorified children, he is going to let the creation in on it too. Curse lifted, pain gone. Until that day, we live in the age of pain. 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Pain is everywhere. Growing up on an apple farm, I experienced what God said to Adam. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. I remember seeing my dad's shoulders just droop. Watching a hailstorm come down. There goes the crop. A year's labor down the drain. I remember him anxiously watching the thermometer during the spring cold snap, just like we had the other day. Just watching that thermometer, how low was it going to go? What's going to happen to the crop? We live in the age of pain. But what the Christian needs to understand is that for us, it is not just unending pain. It is like the pain of childbirth. Difficult as it is, it is temporary and has a wonderful product. No wonder the whole creation is eagerly waiting and looking forward to it. And we, God's redeemed people, are waiting for the same thing. Verse 23. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruit of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. We live in the age of pain. Life is full of it. physical pain, emotional pain. And the pain came in when we all sinned in Adam. But in God's redemptive purpose, the pain will end. The day will come when he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things passed away. Excuse me a second. The glory is coming. And the greatness of the glory can be measured by the fact that it is universe-wide. The whole creation has been groaning in pain, waiting for it. That day, waiting for the glory. But the day will come when the birth is accomplished and the pain is gone and there's nothing but glory. You know, we, we read Psalm 8, the very popular Psalm. And we don't really understand it. Now, the writings of the Hebrews tells us that you have to read Psalm 8 through Jesus. But listen. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet. Yeah. You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also beasts of the field, 
the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You know what? The day will come when people will read Psalm 8 and no one will say, I wonder what that means. It will be right there in front of them. The greatness of the glory can be measured by the fact that for Christians, born again children of God, who are in Christ Jesus, the glory is coming for us. Creation, the whole creation, it's waiting for us. And we're waiting for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, uh, the, the, Paul says that the Holy Spirit within us is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the possession. That's Ephesians 1.14. He is the spirit of adoption as sons, and he supplies us with all we need to walk as adult legal heirs of God in this age of pain. But the redemption will not be a completed transaction until we are completely delivered from sin, spirit, soul, and body. So Paul says to the Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. We are eagerly waiting for adoption. So Paul says to Titus, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of a great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is what Christians do. The glory that we are waiting for is Christ's glory, Paul tells Titus there. The greatness of the glory can be measured by the fact that it is the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not our glory, it's His glory. He is the reason we look forward to the glory. It's his glory and we are in him. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. You know, John, who wrote that, along with Peter and James, got a glimpse of the Lord's glory in the Mount of Transfiguration. But he got the full blast of it on the island of Pampas. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice, like the sound of a trumpet, saying, Write in a book what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and hadn't turned. I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. It's the glory of Jesus Christ. Are you suffering? Are you groaning? As Paul says, the great old creation is we too. The glory is coming. Are you in Christ? If you are, the glory is coming for you. So 
what Jesus says through John. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame, and sat down with my Father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us to grasp a little bit of the coming glory. Change our focus. So that when we weigh the suffering and trials that we go through, we'll be able to say, 